This is the fifth and last part of today's session where we will be talking about brain lesion studies. So the underlying hypothesis in brain lesion studies is that we have a certain brain area that is responsible for some behavior or cognitive function. And because of the lesion, we should observe that the behavior or cognitive function is affected if that brain area is actually involved in the behavior or cognitive function. In animal studies, we have a control over the lesion, so we can decide which part of the brain to um, remove or affect. In human studies, we can of course not do that, but we have given lesions, for example, due to strokes or injuries. If you haven't done so already, I would recommend you now to watch the short video on Phineas Gage. He had um, a damage to his left ventromedial region of the frontal lobe because of an iron rod and his emotions, personality and language related movements were affected. But intellectual, motor and language function were undamaged because um, they are related to a brain region that was not affected by the injury. So as a result, he was able to move, talk and understand language, but his personality changed. So according to Harlow, he was fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires. So Phineas Gage was maybe the first um, lesion study that, or the first case of brain lesion that was studied in detail. If you remember from the first session, uh, the Edwin Smith papyrus also mentions the Egyptian battlefield surgeon who found that those soldiers who had injuries at the left part of their skull, their um, right uh, part of the body was affected. In the 19th century, um, another important discovery was that speech production and speech comprehension was uh, related to different brain regions and was independent of one another um, because one is located in the Broca area and the other one in the Wernicke area. World War II had very many tragic cases of brain patients because the civilians, many civilians were um, affected and severely wounded in World War II and um, later um, some of these patients participated in experiments to better understand which cognitive functions were related to their specific um, damage in, 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 in their in brain areas. Um, and then in the second half of the 20th century, uh, brain surgeries to cure neurological disorders became more popular. Um, one case, one popular case being patient HM. Patient HM was very important in better understanding the role the hippocampus plays in memory and spatial cognition. Um, his hippocampus was removed and he could not build new memories. And also something that became more popular in the second half of the 20th century were split brain patients. So um, the left and right hemisphere were separated to cope, um, to deal with um, severe seizures those patients experienced and um, these split brain patients helped in better understanding the specialization of the left and right hemisphere. So what are typical cases in which humans participate in brain lesion studies? So patients have sometimes surgically removed parts of the brain due to epilepsy or tumors. Patients can have strokes in specific areas of the brain so that parts of their brain are not functional anymore. Um, some patients have brain damage after accidents and there's also viral infections and neurodegenerative disorders that can affect um, brain tissue and destroy brain tissue. Non-human animals um, are a completely different case because here you can experimentally manipulate the brain region by removing parts of the brain. There's also a way of neurochemically removing or killing some neurons in the brain for um, animals. 
So historically, human brain lesion studies have greatly advanced our understanding of the brain. I've already mentioned patient HM, who was critical in better understanding memory and spatial cognition. You will learn more about that patient in session five and six. Another example are patients who have damage to the FFA region of the brain. Those patients are what is sometimes referred to as blind, um, face blind, so they cannot recognize people anymore. And another example would be patient SM who had a destruction of the amygdala because of the Urbach Vita disease, and that patient uh, did not experience fear at all anymore. And you will learn more about patient SM in session eight. Here's an example of how to experimentally test that different brain regions are likely involved in specific cognitive functions. So patient CF had an inability to write vowels but not consonants. For example, if you gave them the word Bologna, they would spell B, L, G and N, but none of the vowels. This shows a single dissociation. They were impaired in task A, namely writing vowels, but not in task B, namely writing consonants. Another patient had the opposite, um, opposite effect. If you gave them a word like record, they would often make spelling errors on consonants. For example, they would write record, but their spelling of vowels was not affected. So another single dissociation. And if you both consider, um, then what you can see is that there is some kind of double dissociation. So they have a complementary profile of abilities, which suggests that there's different brain regions involved in vowel and consonant spelling. What are possible fallacies in lesion studies we need to be aware of? Well, one problem is the so-called task resource effect. That can occur when two tasks share the same resource, but task A uses more of it than task B. So imagine what you observe is that after, so this is the assumption, you have one resource for task A and B, and if, um, so both task A and task B are feeding from that resource, and the fallacy would be that task A and B feed from different resources based on the finding that if you have a lesion related to that resource, then task A is impaired, it's not full, whereas task B is not impaired. Um, the reason for that in this case is, however, they do feed from the same resource, but task R uses more of the resource than task B. So it would be wrong to conclude that they have different resources just because they're differently affected. A second problem that can occur is the so-called task demand artifact. That can occur when two regions are involved in a task and are related to one another, one as resulting in the other one, but only one region is directly affected. So for example, this could be that one region is relevant for understanding task instructions, this prefrontal cortex area here, and another region is responsible for the task execution. Now, if you have a lesion here, what you might observe is that performing the task is affected by that lesion, and the fallacy would be that this region here is responsible for this task but rather it is just imp um, important to understand the instructions for the task. The task itself is performed in that part of the brain. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of brain lesion studies? The advantages are that you can actually have causal inferences which is important because in EEG and fMRI, you have more of a correlational measure. You cannot um, experimentally manipulate the EEG signal. You're measuring the EEG signal and you correlate it to the behavior. 
same is true for fMRI. Another advantage is that you have um, some precision um, is possible that some precision is possible through anatomically or chemically selecting um, selected lesions. So you can, for example, in animal lesion studies, use methods that would only affect very um, specific, very distinct areas of the brain. Disadvantages of brain lesion studies are that the brain damage may result in a reorganization of the cognitive system that cannot always be foreseen. Um, another disadvantage would be that a discrete brain lesion can disrupt the functioning of distant brain regions that are structurally intact, so that it can sometimes be difficult to um, draw clear conclusions. And in humans, it might take a long time to collect data or um, the sample might not be representative. So the way this works is oftentimes that over years you wait for patients to come in with that specific brain area affected. Um, but of course you can also make single case studies, um, which, um, which then ha might have the problem that they're not very representative. In animals, um, it's of course also an important concern that it is an invasive method. Um, so this is related to animal welfare. So um, e any invasive method, even if it's used on animals, needs to be ethically justified. So this might not be um, so it might not be possible to do these studies in animals um, for some research questions. Is there another way to test the causal role of a particular part of the brain without lesions? Well, yes, we can simulate lesions by increasing or decreasing the fire rate, uh, firing rate or excitability, uh, for example, with TMS or TDCS. Uh, you will learn more about that in session 10, Neurostimulation. So much about fMRI imaging studies and brain lesion studies. Thank you very much for your attention and tune in next week when we will talk about the visual system and visual attention.